Kia I'm Harv, Ian Harvey, founder of Collector Intelligence, and this is Stuff That Matters Now. Now my hawkey my, today I'm going to have a chat to Catherine van der Mullen. Kath is from Australia originally. Uh, I met her when she reached out on social media and was interested in Collective Intelligence as a B Corp and we had a chat and it's been, uh, getting to know Kat has taken some time and it's been fascinating to watch her evolve from an organisation she started, Entrepreneurial Woman with Purpose, which I've been intrigued with and then she's working on this wonderful project at the moment Girls Who Grow, focused on young women in the ag sector. Uh, and it's a fascinating journey because Kath came from the fashion sector in Sydney to New Zealand to now focused on the ag sector. Wonderful to have her involved in the sector that desperately needs some new blood. So really looking forward to seeing where this might, might go this afternoon. So uh, enjoy, peeps. Welcome back, everybody. I am in Christchurch, sitting across the table from Catherine Van Mullen. Good afternoon, Kath. Hello, hello. And one fly. One we've got, fly. We've, we've only got one. We've thankfully. got one fly, but it is pissing you off, and it's cruising around. And anyway, we'll try and just forget about the fly. Uh, the fly, Kath. Thank you for your time this afternoon. You are welcome. And uh, as you can pick up, Kath is from Australia, from Sydney, I think. Originally. Originally. Yes. You're very good at going, that's over there and this it is, is here. It is over there. Because uh, my roots are not Aussie, right? What are Aussies? Unless you're Aboriginal, what are Aussies? We're all descendants of, the, of Euro. So really we are, I'm Dutch, I'm British, I'm Australian by roots of where I was born, but that's not who I am. Right. Yeah. So who are you? Oof, it's a big question. I love starting with who am I? And I want to tell you a story of how I figured out who I was. And I read a wonderful book called The Untethered Soul. Have you read it, Harv? Mm-hmm. Michael Asinger. Blue mm. book with a horse on the front. Mm, I'm mm. saying yes, but I, th- I mean no. Anyway, chapter four, it's unbelievable. It's called Who Am I? And it says, am I a series of letters that make up my name? Am I C-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E? No, I'm not. I'm not Catherine Van Mullen, which is too long to spell right now. But that's not who I am. Am I, um, what are the things that make up who I am? I start to think of the roles that I play. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a businesswoman. I'm a mother. You know, you start to think of, you know, the roles that you play. But that's actually not who you are. And so what it does through this book is actually encourages you to connect to your most authentic self to who you are. I'm an adventurer. I'm uh, I'm a traveler. I am, you know, a experience seeker. So these these become the things of ultimately who you are, less about the roles that you play and who you are from your historical sense of these are the roles that I played and these are my roots, but ultimately who am I? And through that book and also the work that I did with this amazing man in Australia who was a kinesiologist, his name was Rudy, uh, he really helped me to dissect who I was by figuring out who I wasn't associated with my parents and the way that I was brought up. So less about what they valued and actually unpacking what was really important to me. And then I was able to step forward as this most authentic self of who I was because I actually knew who I was. But I don't think you even know who you are really until you've had children. And I don't know why that's a pivotal part, but I think you're able to connect to your most authentic self once you've had children because the other shit doesn't matter because actually you've just got to try and raise small humans to be the best versions of themselves. Um, So I think we are able to get to that most authentic self of who we are. But who am I? I'm Catherine van der Mullen. I am of Dutch, British descent, born in Australia, now living in New Zealand. I've been living in the beautiful Awatere Valley for the last four years. We have moved to Christchurch recently, um, searching for better education for our children. Um, 
so yeah, we're here in the concrete jungle, slightly suffocating in the concrete jungle with other humans living so close, but it's an adjustment, Harv, it's a, an adjustment. And so you've moved from, from the valley yep. to here for the education primarily? Yep, Yep. solely. And solely, and yep. then you travel back to the valley to yep. get have the space? To have the reprieve, to be able to connect back to the land, being able to take my shoes off and wander in the garden. It's a bit sloppy up there at the moment. Um, but it's a beautiful place, you know, being surrounded by the mountains, although there's a bit too many, a few too many um, grapes up there in our valley. It's a bit more like a factory up there at the moment, which is a bane of my um, existence. But ultimately, it's a beautiful, a beautiful place. And so it's a nice place to escape to. And Kath, you have transitioned from one industry into quite another. Hmm. Tell me about that. They're slightly connected, if you think about it, but... My world of growing up in the fast fashion world had nothing to do with natural fibres. There was nothing natural about polyester and things that are ultimately made out of plastic and petrol. So uh, I grew up in the fashion industry in Australia. So when I left school at the age of 18, I went straight into our family business. I thought it was everything that made me who I was. Uh, but actually, that was my father's journey that we were all going on of building this building this empire. I was like, what was that noise? Jesus. Oh, no, it's, a, it's a rough <laughs> neighbourhood. Anyway, we've just had a hoon outside. We, <laughs> we're back. Um, so, yes, I have no idea what we were just talking about, Hav. So um, you're talking about your father building the, the empire? Yes, and obviously we, I never was even asked at school if there was anything different that I wanted to do, which is this expectation of this is the, this is the life role that you're going to, going to take. And I started to see that there was not a values alignment, even though I didn't know what values were at the age of 25. I could see that there were some conflicts of, you know, business and things that weren't quite sitting right in, you know, building a building an empire and being me, being a part of a fashion business. But I never really questioned it so much until I had children and I started to educate myself more and I went to university at the age of 30, I think, and did a business degree and majored in marketing and looked at all these other things like microfinancing and impact investing. And these things really just opened my eyes to, and I became a continuous learner and this desire for continuous learning. Uh, and it really hasn't stopped since then. So I think it's been in the transition of now coming into this world as knowing who you are and what's important to you but then having a level of education and education beyond the traditional private school education, the university education, but life education as well, and then being able to figure out actually who am I and what is my place in the world, what's important to me and how do I build the most meaningful life around that. So I guess transitioning of one of our projects is around agriculture and farming and engaging our next generation of female leaders into that space that transition has come from me moving from the hustle and bustle of Sydney to the slower paced, slightly isolated Awateri Valley and connecting and having conversations at the table with our local farmers and understand, understanding what's going on whilst also educating myself on topics like carbon or, you know, environmental, various environmental issues relating to soil and sequestration of uh, carbon in soil and things that I knew nothing, nothing about two years ago, let alone 10 years ago. I don't even think we were even talking about carbon, that's for sure. So that's, I guess, where the, how the transition has come about. I guess I've always been interested in living a more organic lifestyle and it probably wasn't until I left Sydney and then spending more time in a nature-based environment that I was able to connect and start to build the most meaningful life. And I still, I'm still on that journey to building the most meaningful life because it certainly isn't here in the walls of concrete, that's for sure. So it's a, a transition. So, Kath, the person that was the 25-year-old involved in the fashion industry in yep. Sydney and where you are now... Yeah. What are the difference between those two people? The Kath from here, the 25-year-old, mm. to the Kath here? The 40, I think I'm 44, 43 or 44-year-old version is a lot more educated, is a lot more conscious, is a lot more aware, is a lot more knowing and confident with who I am 
and what's important to me and being able to stick to that. I think I was swayed very easily at the age of 25 to what everyone else's journey that they wanted me to be on. Um, so that's been a really you know, pivotal difference in how I feel at 25. Um, but I think just being knowledgeable on lots of different topics and not siloing myself and having a broad range of interests across a lot of different topics uh, thanks to the beloved Audible, which I've now realised the other day I've read 37 books in the last 18 months. It's such an incredible way to be able to learn on any topic. Um, yeah, I'm just an educated, more evolved version of 25. Probably my values have evolved and I've really connected to my values, not my parents' values, not my mother's values, not my father's values because their values are descendants of their parents' values that have nothing to do with me. So it's almost like a decoupling. Yeah, and an unlearning, a decoupling and an unlearning of who you think you are. Mm. Yeah. Because when you talk about your grandparents and so forth and you said they had nothing to do with me, well, they do because mm. there is that genetic, that, there's yep. that link. Yeah. Right, so that's... But values. Push, yeah. But their realities and what they were dealing with at the time were vastly different than what you're dealing with now. Correct. Yeah. And it's funny because I think that's really important not to judge previous generations because we don't know what it was like for them to go through world wars, to go through and all the trauma that came from there, the, the, the trauma from shifting from one country to another, all that sort of stuff, right? And it's... it's um, but, yeah, that's interesting. So have you... Your relationship with your family, I'm just interested... How's that changed as you've gone through that transition? Mm, I guess I was always the black sheep half, which you may have also been as well, maybe. Um, he says nothing. Uh, nothing to support my, my views of that. Um, I guess there's always been a challenged connection between myself, my parents, my siblings who all have very different views of the world and how we should live. I guess I've taken my own journey and not really worried about what everyone else was doing. So we just have different approaches to life and that has caused conflict, yes, many a conflict over the years, particularly between my father and I when he was alive. Mm. So, um, you know, I was a rebellious child not wanting to stick with the status quo if we had to wear these stupid hats at school or wear particular kinds of socks or particular kinds of shoes, I was like, no, not wearing those. So like even at a young age of like eight or ten where I was kind of slightly just, you know, breaking the traditional status quo of what kind of shoes we're allowed to wear at school, for example. Um, so I've always probably tried to nudge to my way of thinking. Mm. It's interesting. I think there's a correlation there because you touched on it before about this lifelong learning thing. Because mm. uh, if people are really dedicated to that, then they change and they evolve. And, and they can be confusing sometimes because they believe something this year and they might believe something quite different next year. Yeah. And that can be, I think that can be hard to be around for friends and family sometimes. I know I've faced that. Yeah. That it's like, well, what's he on about now? Yeah, you know, or they said, but you used the to bandwagon believe bandwagon that you're on now. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, and and things like uh, what you didn't used to believe that. I go, no, mm. I've changed my mind. And I think mm. changing your mind is really important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think a lot of people get stuck in their mindset of what they know, and I think there's a lot of unlearning that we need to do to then have a new foundation to start from and actually go. This is an amazing world. How could we potentially attract all of this diverse other people's thinking and not be so stuck and narrow-minded in one in one way in one approach? Um, and I think that generational those generational shifts and taking what your former generation thought was the right thing to do and shifting that and actually challenging that a little bit. And I think the only way that you can challenge that is through being educated on a different 
yeah. approach and trialing that different approach if it's if it's relevant um, and seeing how that works out and then changing that again you know why do we need to be who we were when we were 25 why yep. is that going to be now yep. we can constantly evolve I think the key word for me when you're describing that is foundation Kath, mm. because I think that there does need to be a foundation to build on so I have witnessed people who bounce around searching for something mm. and it seems like they're slightly unhinged because I don't think the foundation has been developed so I think yep. um, having that foundation whatever it is and I couldn't really describe what it is I think values as part of it mm. are an anchoring that's thing that's the anchoring yeah right as, as I can anchor here and then I can these other influences that come in I can respond to those mm. but the foundation is, stays um, pretty solid I think that's really important because yeah. without that, it can look very unhinged. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Floppy, floppy. Yeah. yeah. And I think for me, the quest to finding the most meaning f meaning in my life is helping me to search for where my place is in the world, and that curiosity or inquisitiveness to kind of ask the you know, the dumb questions to, to move forward into different places and just having that level of curiosity, with, knowing that my main mission is to have the most meaningful life and doing the most meaningful work that I can. And I finally feel like I'm at a place now where I am doing the most meaningful work that I've ever done in my life. And it's a, it's a combination of lots of different things. It's some are relating to education, some are relating to entrepreneurship, some are relating to, you know, young people. It's all quite diverse, environment, farming. There's lots of diverse, but they all somehow come together because when you blend those things together, our days are our life in miniature. We've got this one opportunity today to actually have that level of meaning, but it's an ongoing, continuous exploration to find more meaning. What, what are you really good at? Hmm. What am I really good at? I think creating meaningful partnerships, particularly uh, with organisations. <clears throat> and if I think about over the years, the organisations that we have worked with and built these meaningful partnerships that encompass, you know, that are values aligned and connect to their audiences, that's something that I really love growing from the grassroots up uh, and finding those right organisations because actually finding those right organisations can be a challenge first and foremost. Um, but then being able to build on those values aligned um, partnerships. So that's something that I really love and I love see come to come to fruition. Mm. You know, if I think about our girls who grow um, work and the partnerships, we haven't found that right partner yet we've had a huge amount of rejection huge i'm so sick of being rejected on this project but i know deep down that the universe has got mm. another bloody plan and i know that those right organizations and those right partnerships will come to support us and wrap their arms around us when they are those right partners and maybe we've just been looking at the wrong places for the wrong partners yep so, yeah. And look, we'll come, we'll come back to girls who grow very, very soon because that's, you know, I'm really intrigued with the work you're doing there. The, what was interesting is that you made contact with me because of B Corp, wasn't it? Mm. B Corp. No, I think it was your handsome photo on um, and LinkedIn. And that, oh, look, it's, a, it's an issue, right? I get. It is an issue. It was very stealth. If you remember <laughs> the first one, you had your, uh, I can still remember it because I was like, geez, this guy's confident. <laughs> His arm up against the wall, very suave shirt on. You remember it? You remember it? I, I think do. you might have been pouting too. Yeah. And the team have taken that down because they thought it was rubbish. They <laughs> said, You're not like that at all. Well, I'm blushing. <laughs> I'm blushing. Oh, this is so funny. Well, it was that. It was that photo that we connected. Oh, and B Cop, yes. <laughs> the the fascinating thing with working with you, Kath, so what, here's what I know that you're really good at, and this is why I love working with you, is you're so fucking organised. You do say that, but I don't think that I am that organised. My children tell me that I'm not, um, but you think I am, so I'll take it. Well, it, it, 
in, in doing business, you are, I think, for me, you know, like you set up this meeting today, I get an invite, you know, I was asking to come and see you. You put it in my diary, I know exactly where to go. I did go to the wrong house, but that was my mistake. But you, you're very... Um, and the thing is that you're very trustworthy because you do what you say you're going to do. Mm. Yeah. And I really appreciate that. That's a big deal to me. Mm. Yeah. I love the word, word trust. And we've spoken about it a lot um, as you've been evolving your own projects and that connection. And it's something that I've been working with organisations to support them to build those trusted relationships. And a lot of people don't quite connect to the word trust. What have, tell me about trust in your world. Look, I've, I've, I've got a conversation with somebody at the moment who doesn't believe in our vision, which is building an ecosystem built on trust, generosity and fun. Mm. And he's, he said, I, I don't buy into that. And mm. I'm like, cool, buddy. That's mm. fine. I, you know, I, I, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Um, and I think Brené Brown gave us some wonderful um, framework around trust. So, you know, I cannot say I'm trustworthy. Only somebody mm. else can bestow yes. that on you, right? Yep. And so that's why I say to you, Kath, I, you know, th- the reason I like working with you is uh, regardless of what your kids say, <laughs> you do you do what you say you're going to do. You, I find you very trustworthy, reliable, all that sort of stuff. And that is more important to me than any... Mm. Any glamour, any of that sort of stuff, right? It's actually yep. having people around you that you know are going to be there. Mm. And here's an example. There is, we work with people and you have an event. You have, you have a, a meeting. And you wonder, I wonder if they're going to turn up or not. Mm. And you know, that, you know those ones. And they turn up and go, oh, it's like a, oh, cool, that's a bonus. Mm. You have other people that you set a meeting and you know mm. they're going to be there on time. And this is something I didn't naturally do. I've had to learn that and learn that it was dis- disrespectful to turn up late, mm. things like that. So now I'm generally never late. But so I think... I think you're often trust early is, sometimes. If I think back to our uh, call time that we had for Lake Howie Station, yep. you were so worried about being late that you actually scaled the field. I did. I, did. Well, I felt locked out. Oh, locked out. The buses hip, locked me out. Hips and all. <laughs> That's right, they just had new hips put on. But so I think, I think you know, trust is a fundamental mm. attribute in people, okay, yep. that, that when you turn up... Underrated, I would say, in organisations with being able to engage all stakeholders yep. and bring everyone on that journey and change and move collectively together needs to be built on trust. Not on sales, not on promotions, not on profit relationships and connectivity and creating that place of belonging and move forward with trust. I've been harping on about it for decades. And it is very uncool or unsexy just turning up when you say you're going to turn up. There is nothing flash about that. But Oh, you, you know, think we should be late? You no, should, I don't. should have stood outside no, the gate. It's, you know, compared to some of the other attributes, right, trust is just a, you know, mm. a wonderful, um, wonderful thing. A wonderful foundational Value. Yeah. 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 Kath, when I first met you, you had begun a, uh, an organisation called Entrepreneurial Woman of Purpose. With purpose. With purpose. Yeah. Could be of, but it's with. And with purpose. So what was the, what was the catalyst mm. of that? I guess when I had moved to New Zealand and I was trying to connect with lots of different people and I'd started with the B Corp community because I knew they were the values aligned crew that I would want to spend time with and learn from. Um, And so through that process, and obviously those conversations uh, were probably very different, but there was a lot of other conversations bolstered around that with particularly women from all over New Zealand who had done some incredible things in their life but weren't really shouting from the rooftops or sharing what they were doing. They're very humble. And I've later realised that that is a, a, a true trait of New Zealanders of just kind of quietly going behind, you know, um, and over overachieving but not being able to celebrate that. And I really wanted to celebrate those voices. And it really started as very raw as that. How do we celebrate the voices of women who are doing really important and interesting, interesting things, which is how entrepreneurial women with purpose 
started and I just asked one woman to share her story and in the most vulnerable and authentic way that she could. And what I realized when I asked people to be vulnerable and honest about telling and sharing their story, I got a mixed reaction from people because it was hard to be vulnerable and share, you know, their whole selves. Um, and so we had to kind of massage that, I guess, along the, along the way, you know, Aussies have, um, a very different approach and they're singing from the rooftops about, you know, who they are and all of their achievements and, you know, wanting people to celebrate that. But I love the culture of New Zealand, that it is a lot more, that it is a lot more humble, but I just think there's so many beautiful stories that could have been told. So it was really about telling and sharing stories in multiple different ways. What Entrepreneurial Women With Purpose has evolved into is how do we support these women to not only tell and share their stories, but educate them and nurture them and, you know, um, celebrate the best version of themselves uh, and connecting to their most authentic selves along the way and being more vulnerable. Because if I have a vulnerable conversation with you, you will have a vulnerable conversation with me. And I think we need to have more of those vulnerable conversations to have deeper conversations and not just this surface level crap and actually get to the root of what's going on in your world, not what you want me to know, but the truth really. Of and Kath, that's you know, a lot of the work we do with collective intelligence mm. is the vulnerability that, that uh, you, you cannot be, you cannot connect. You cannot connect very well without being authentic and or without being vulnerable. Right? Yeah. And, you know, and I've said this to you before, when I first engaged with you mm. and I saw your photo, <laughs> can you bring up the photo? I saw your photo and I'm going, I remember who photo. is this glamour pos? I remember that and, and, and That's not me anymore. And I was just like, oh, I thought, I don't want anything I think he do. swore. I think he didn't say it so kindly. I think he swore. <sighs> <laughs> True. What's this chick want? You didn't even answer me. And I was just like, what? And then we had the conversation and you asked me that question. We'd had a conversation. You said, when was the last time you cried? <gasps> Remember that? Shit. That was bold. And it was just like... And what was your answer when I when Well, I the, said... answer, the answer was um, four days before and I'd just had my second hip operation. I was laying in the sun and it had been a horrendous year. I'd had five operations. Shit. And this was the last one. It had gone quite well. And I was lying in the sun. It was November. And I thought, fuck, I'm, I'm through this. I'm, I'm, I'm there. You know, it was just like... And I remember feeling these um, tears of relief and gratitude. But I thought, who asks a question like that? That's not true. Is it not true? That's not why you were crying. That wasn't the story. You oh, screwed have up I the made story. that up? What yeah, was the other story? you made it up. <laughs> <laughs> Your sister... Ah, that's right. Yeah. I think you were being nostalgic and listening to a piece of music that brought up all of the emotions oh, relating to God. your sister. It was too. It was too. And it then was we still related that. To, it was still related to, to her. Sorry, you were quite right. I, but I was still lying in the... It was quite right because she had seven hip replacements mm. and then died of cancer, which mm. was just, you know... And yes, it was. And then I remember you telling me a beautiful story about your connection with your sister. Um, yeah, and why that was so emotional. And I don't know why I asked you that question. What made me, you know, it was our first conversation. I'm not sure why I asked you that question. Tell mm. me about the last time you cried. It's like a <laughs> psychologist asking you that. Anyway, that How does got that on. make you feel? That, got, that didn't, yeah. Okay, moving on. Well, did that change your? your that yeah, changed it did. Your it did. That changed, it changed. That, that changed. That changed my perception. Yes. All right. It's my podcast. I Kat, know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to edit all this shit out. Right. I'm interviewing you. It's been switched back because, of course, it is a perception. It was a perception of a photograph. Yeah. Well, the same as your photograph of your blue steel. All right. All right. God, just. Good thing is nobody listens to this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So here are two people who had a perception of each other that was mm. not that accurate. Yeah, yeah, true. Okay. Should we move on? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, yeah. So that was Entrepreneurial Woman with Purpose. Thank you. Now, I had a fabulous weekend away uh, with you and a group of other women down at Lake Harvey Station a couple of years ago. Yeah, November months. 21. Yep. Yep. And I felt very privileged and honoured to be invited there. It's a stunning place, and it was I was the only fellow there. I think invited that weekend. That was that was that was kind of cool. How you say invited? Huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, it was, and was that the birth of? Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about that. Yeah, so I guess where behind that was the development of a conversation between Justine Ross and I after we had worked on this Toitu um, project. They are New Zealand's only climate positive farm and Toitu, as part of a project with Entrepreneur Women With Purpose, had invited uh, Jeff and Justine to speak. And I was just blown away by their energy and their commitment and their knowledge and all of these things that I knew nothing about, like carbon, for example, um, a couple of years ago. And I was intrigued by what they were doing at Lake Hawea Station. Um, It was also one of the other guys on the call, a guy called Doug Avery from up in Marlborough, who had shared this video with me about young women in agriculture in the UK. And it was like a recruitment to bring more young women into agriculture and said we're innovative we're leaders we're deep thinkers we're you know engineers and we're you know creative and we're this but we're women and we're working in farming and agriculture and you wouldn't really think that this is where we would this was where we would be um and when I caught up with Josie after after that she said well why don't you come and use like how station as a a place to kind of come up with ideas to develop a program around the things that are important to you relating to how do you get more young women into agriculture and farming and um, so it really just evolved from there. Um, we took 12 amazing people down to Lake Hawea Station for three days. And the main premise of that was that I really wanted to unpack three juicy topics, things that I'm passionate about, entrepreneurial mindset, and how do we bring more entrepreneurship and that mindset to the table of kind of outside thinkers and, you know, status quo challenges. And, you know, we know what the entrepreneurial mindset is. Meaningful leadership, which I'd been learning a lot about through a beautiful book called One Life, How We Forgot to Live Meaningful Lives. Uh, And meaningful leadership encompasses purpose, belonging, personal growth and leadership and the magic that happens when those four things come together and actually create... So just give us those four again. Purpose, belonging, Mm -hmm. personal growth Mm -hmm. and leadership Mm -hmm. and the, the culmination of those four things coming together to creating the most meaningful human being that we can be in a with meaningful meaningful work and so I really wanted to go okay well how does that align with entrepreneurial mindset how do we bring that meaningful leadership but how is environmental stewardship what I was only just learning about through our work with Toitu how does the environmental guardianship bolster all those things underneath and so I shared that with Josie and she said well come and use Lake Hawea Station and um, you know, bring a collective of minds to the table, and we'll go from we'll go from there. Uh, so we obviously took a crew crew down there uh, for three days, and really to unpack those topics. But as you well know, by the time the champers and the red wine had come out on Saturday afternoon, we were getting really creative about what we could possibly do. We were talking about NFTs and Web three point zero and owning land and all sorts of wonderful things. But they were. There were so many ideas buzzing and I had no idea of how to really bring it together. Uh, but we went out after that convers- after that weekend and shared the ideas with lots of different people across the industry and outside of the industry and had a huge amount of rejection, overwhelmingly rejection of no closed doors, not interested, don't understand it. And when I heard the don't understand it, I realised that I didn't actually understand what we were ultimately trying to achieve. And it wasn't until we went through the Creative HQ GovTech Accelerator last September and really dug deep into the problem, worked on through a beautiful discovery process to really understand what the meaning behind that problem was from lots of different stakeholders, teenage girls, farmers, teachers their parents a whole lot of different people through that discovery process that we could actually come up with a solution that met the need of that met the need of that problem which is how girls who grow 
have started to formulate. And our main focus is about empowering and engaging our next generation of female leaders into climate positive agriculture by being able to connect them back to the land in the most authentic way. We need to get our hands dirty. We need to get our feet in the soil. Um, we need to be out on the land. What is the problem you're solving? The problem that we're solving is young people are disengaged and not interested in farming, but we know that we need food security and we have huge issues relating to food. You know, if we think about the price of food, for example, and food security globally. So that's one part and it's also the climate crisis. Young people are particularly motivated around being part of that solution to the climate crisis, but hadn't thought about agriculture and farming as being part of that solution. So just being able to educate them and open their eyes and trigger their imaginations and trigger their creativity and allowing them the space to get creative. So we've designed these imagination-centred workshops that we're facilitating in schools and young girls that had never even thought about the land or never even thought about growing food or never even thought about farming and agriculture and food and fashion and those in that way and now we're sparking their interest and getting them to imagine what their role could be in this. And it's been so incredibly rewarding to connect to young people. And I guess this is something which ties all of my work over my whole lifetime. Back in my fashion days, I was designing programs for our young people. Our target audience at Supre was 15 and 16 year old girls. And I wrote two programs. One was called um, Healthy Body, Healthy Mind to help young people. There was huge issues with anorexia and bulimia and eating disorders. Um, and it was related to food um, and helping. Uh, so Healthy Body, Healthy Mind was one. And then the other one that I wrote just after I gave birth to one of my children called Discover Your Purpose, which is about supporting young people to find their purpose um, and building a life that was far more meaningful at a much younger age rather than getting to 40 and go, shit, I've got to build a life of purpose and then have wasted a, you know, 15 or so years. So I think the thread between all of the, all of my worlds, thinking back to our initial discussion around fashion to agriculture, actually the underpinning piece is education and actually building programs designed for young people Mm. is really what I'm truly passionate about. We've got a director with collective intelligence, Finn, Sherwell, who is a profoundly wise man, uh, 26 years of age, and he's found his purpose at 26. Amazing. And he went looking for it. Yeah. And now he's devoting his life to fulfilling that purpose. And I'm just going... Amazing. That's just, you know, and it's a, it's a lifetime's work ahead of him, and it's going to be fascinating to see how it unfolds. Yeah, and I love saying to people that we've got Finn on our board before he's famous. <laughs> you know, it's it's it's. Uh, um, but I just marvel at somebody at that age because when I was twenty six, I wouldn't have even thought of that. Yeah, no purpose was no no purpose was, and values. They weren't things that we were thinking no, about. No purpose, value, and carbon. Goodness, yeah, those three things together. Yeah. So, what is if you look ten years out, mm. or sometime in the future? And you look back and go, this thing's starting to really make some impact. What have you what have you done? What have you created? I think there's two big parts that we've got a movement of educated young women connecting back to the land and part of a solution to the climate crisis being agriculture as that channel to get there. And looking back, I'd like to say we don't have one climate positive farm in New Zealand. We've got 50,000 climate positive farms in New Zealand. And I think that would be a massive achievement if we had more young people, more climate positive farms. That would be an achievement looking Mm. back in the next 10 years. Mm. And that we're all still here because if you spend time with Josie, we're not going to be here. Yeah, well, luckily she's not. She's here. a well-educated woman. Yeah, well-read. Yeah, too well-read, I say, Jazzy. Yeah, it's um, it's it's um, and fortunately we've got this thing called regeneration, which means mm, that we can. It's a beautiful word. We in can itself, change. Isn't it? We can change some outcomes 
if we apply ourselves to it. Yeah. Yeah. What's the definition of regenerative for you, Harv? <sighs> Look, there's lots of them. There's lots of them. But I think for me, it's around creating something that every time the cycle turns, whatever that cycle is. Mm, the that, natural cycle. Yeah, that the environment improves. Yeah. The env- environment improves for the next generation. So whether that is plants, animals, people, mm. whatever, that as we turn that cycle and it's an active thing and it's moving and it's not perfect. So that's a very broad sense. Mm. Uh, and... I push back hard on people who talk about sustainability mm, and go... I can't sustain this crap. <laughs> no, I said there was no... It's not sustainable. Yeah, I said let, let us whiteies work with sustainability and watch what happens. Watch what happens, yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, I am hopeful, Kath, with the enormous challenges we've got ahead and we're seeing a glimmer just this summer of all the destruction from flooding and mm-hmm. and so forth and... And then that is just the tip of the iceberg compared to the loss of um, biosecurity or you know biodiversity. Um, mm. uh, and you know there are native trees in New Zealand now struggling to reseed because they're not germinating because the mm. climate has changed, mm. or the insects and so forth aren't there, or the fungi aren't there to break down the seeds. So you know we have got some massive challenges here, but so. Without regeneration, I would be sitting here going, we're toast. Mm. Uh, that we, we just need it on a mass scale, Yeah, the regeneration on mass scale, and it's going to come from mindset shift first and foremost, first and foremost around that regenerative mindset. And that's why I love what you're doing with Girls Who Grow because women have brought in so much change mm. over the years. Mm. And I don't know whether they've brought in more change than men. I don't know the answer to that. Mm. But I do know when women... Just a different approach. Yeah. When women, um, you know, certainly men didn't give women the vote. Mm. You know, women had to fight for that. And so, and I love the fact that the, the I see some of the young women that, are clustering around this movement, mm. you know, it's, it must give you a lot of hope. It does. Uh, and I love the thing you said before about the rejection piece, you know, it's just, it's, it sucks mm. and it wears you down. Uh, but then if you look at who is being attracted to this movement, mm. you know, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and it hasn't necessarily come from the channels that we explored that we thought were the known ones, it's actually come full circle and it's a a completely other approach that we weren't expecting. And I love those unexpected. Well, that's the the beauty of regeneration. It's so unpredictable. Yeah. You know, the old style of farming for me was all about power and control and predictability. And the regenerative thing is, yeah, and the regenerative program is so unpredictable and in a paddock you've got all these differences within one small paddock mm. which in the old system I didn't like because mm. it didn't wasn't uniform and it mm. wasn't controlled so that's the thing with regeneration and it's imagine really what's going on, on, on yeah. underneath the soil in terms of regeneration when you've got all of that plethora of biodiversity on yep. the top um, yeah now Kath I am looking at time and these I'm just showing you that because you've got children to sort out. I do. How are we doing? Yeah it's 3.33 look at that look at that time. It's 3.33. That's serendipitous. Very very organized (laughs) mate. When when do we need to wrap this up? Whenever. Whenever. Oh really we're just going to let the kids play on the street and they'll be fine? (laughs) They'll be fine. (laughs) Kath I want to go back to this Australian New Zealand thing. My pushback is, yes, Kiwis can be very humble and that's all nice, but we the, the flip side of that is we are buggers at having this tall poppy syndrome. The tall poppy syndrome is as an in, awful as concept. In knocking, as knocking down, knocking down the tall poppies in New Zealand. So people who... Yeah. Are you even familiar with the term? Well, poppy? I only became familiar with it 
familiar with it when I moved to New Zealand. I'd never even heard about it there you go. before. Yep. And it came up in a number of the podcasts that I recorded with different women. I was like, what is this stuff? So, yeah, I, I don't know what a solution is. I just think we need to start by walking alongside other people and whether they are more educated, better backgrounds, more interesting things, whatever those differences are, we need to celebrate those differences and actually walk alongside each other rather than trying to crush and put them down because they, because you are different to what they know or you challenge them in a particular way. And you see it in, you know, in lots of different organisations and the conversations that you hear through other people. Um, you know, I don't know, I don't know what a solution is to it because it is quite bound yep. in this culture and it's very destructive. Yep. And I don't think we can grow from a place of, from that. Yeah. And I, think well, I don't think we're going to grow any lovely poppies in the field of biodiversity, <laughs> that's for sure. I, I do think as part of the passive-aggressive tendency that Kiwis can have and, and that is, you know, not um, saying what we mean sometimes mm. and, and sometimes just not saying anything, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, but it's something that I think... You know, because what you described before with the Aussies going out and cel celebrating success and so forth, mm. I think we could do with a little bit more of that. Yeah. Uh, definitely. And, you know, I've been intrigued to watch with this movement of Girls Who Grow mm. as it develops how it's going to be interesting to see the headwinds turn up with that and how people will push back at that. Mm. It's already changing. It's interesting of seeing the change when it's the right time for people to accept it differently. It's already starting. Whereas before it was like, who are you and why are you playing in agriculture? And like, who are you and why are you not playing in the future of food? Right? And the collective of organisations that are now seeing what it is and wanting to be a part of that journey. And that's probably the better way to do it because then you're actually attracting those right people to cluster and wrap their arms around this project because mm. you do need that right people. You're dealing with young women and you're dealing with the rest of – or a part of the rest of their lives. Um, we need to make sure we've got the right, right people on the journey with us. So up until now, I've seen LinkedIn posts and so forth where – You've been starting down south, I think, with some schools. We have. Yep. yep. Tell me about that. So, yeah, we bolstered it around the area where our one climate positive farm is in Lake Hawia. Uh, so we have been doing imagination-centred workshops at Wakatipu High in Queenstown, Dunstan and Mount Aspiring College. Goodness, I have to think about that one. Mount Aspiring, Dunstan and Wakatipu. So we had collectives of young women and men, young boys, men, men, uh, who attended those. We didn't want to alienate the boys and not invite them, so mm -hmm. we invited everyone and we had a real mix of people who attended. Uh, and really those two-hour sessions were to tell and share stories about different women's journeys to connecting back to the land through their work um, and also to spark their imagination to design a future that they ultimately wanted to be a part of. We didn't talk about agriculture and sheep and animals and... You know, we spoke about them connecting to the land and to and through food. Uh, so we tried to take a different, a different approach. Um, and they've been incredibly well received and moving. I was at uh, Mount Aspiring again last week, and the careers advisor had told me that generally Lincoln University comes, and it's not a massive attendance for those sessions. This year was very different. And I, you know, brushed it off and said, oh, you know, there's lots of stuff going on in the media about agriculture. And then I just like, no, no. You guys were here about a month before talking about this stuff and how important it is and how they can build meaningful careers. This was a contribution. This was a contribution. Nice. So, yeah. 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 So Girls Who Grow does not exclude boys. No. And so if you describe it like that, Kath, it's, it's actually bringing more feminine energy to agriculture? Yes. Without putting words in your mouth? Yes, absolutely. Yep. 
And because what I'm intrigued with, and we've had this conversation, I've been involved in some of some of your development work, that my concern is, mm. having been in the farming sector, that you educate these young women, you inspire them to step into the industry and the industry doesn't want them. Yeah, and then there's the rejection and the walls. Yeah, and I, I still am concerned about that, but I know every year that goes by, it must be getting better, must yep. be. Uh, it's definitely still a concern, but I think we just need to keep planting, planting the seeds and the industry is definitely changing. I'm doing a huge amount of work and connecting with farmers, particularly in Hawke's Bay and Gisborne at the moment. And some who are open to having a little bit of a deeper conversation about the future. Because at the moment it's kind of one foot in front of the other because they're dealing with, they're going through stages of cyclone recovery. Um, so... We're not talking too far in the future, but some of them you can start to feel a sense of change and doing things differently, retiring certain land. So the movement is there. It will take a little bit more time for the willing, the capable, the able, the educated to kind of bolster around that movement. But it is a concern, Harv, that we are going to educate, nourish and nurture, change the narrative for these young women throw them out into the wider world and then they realise that agriculture and the farming industry is still the same world that they had perceived it and when we're going to lose them. So collectively, we need to change the story and get lots of different minds at the table to change that story and really co-create with these young women the industry that they would like to see. And you very harshly, not long after we met, when I told you I was designing a program for RSC workers from Vanuatu, swiftly told me that who are you as a privileged white woman to tell these women from Vanuatu what they should be educated on? And that has stuck with me. We need to co-create the industry with young people, not with all the heads of all the different organisations at the table, there's never going to be an agreement there. We know that. But actually let the young people design the industry that they want to be a part of the future and then the industry needs to respond and adapt their organisations to what those young people's needs are. And I think that's the only way that we can design the right pathway for them. Apologise, it was a bit harsh, Kath. It was a bit harsh, but it has stuck and it has made me rethink and constantly be reminded of that co-creation. Because if I just go into, a, into an organisation or I go into a school and we just deliver what we think they want to learn, we've missed a big chunk of opportunity. So now when we're redesigning the next stages of Girls Who Grow, we're having these other conversations with young women. What are their challenges? What are they interested in? What are they passionate about seeing change in? And really starting to understand them and their interests a lot more to design this next stage of Girls Who Grow. And Kath, there is a... You're working with a fabulous young woman, Amy Blake. Amy Blake is a fabulous young woman. And, she is indeed. Yeah, and I saw a piece of you shared a piece of writing about mm, imagining what she a story. Yeah, and that was interesting. That was the first time I thought. Uh, what do I think? It was the freedom of which she could express her views of what she wanted. Yeah, that's what I saw. Yeah. And if we were to do that, same, have that same model to allow young people to express that freely to the world that they want to create and then the industries match that, that is, that is how we design, design the future yeah. that we want to live in. Amy is an incredible um, master of words uh, and has written an incredible amount of poetry and stories uh, and has you know, allowed her imagination to go wild with coming up with... <coughs> and designing a designing a future. And I think what a fabulous ambassador 
for this program. Isn't she? And uh, and I do have a huge amount of faith in uh, this generation coming through. I was going to say younger generation, well, there's lots of my age, most of the younger generation, but that generation coming through, there's some really... Uh, there's some really wonderful thinkers mm. who are uh, applying themselves. Well-read thinkers. Yep. Yep. Um, and Finn Ross is one, you know, and it's it's um, and you listen to the wisdom, you know, he reminds me a lot of Finn, um, Finn Sherwell. Mm. Um, but yeah, very deep thinking, committed to creating a new a new paradigm. Yeah, deep thinking and and thoughtful in the in the execution as well. Yeah, yeah. Kath, what what would you like to wrap up this podcast with? What have we what have we missed? What would I like to wrap this conversation up with? Um, I guess the role we've been speaking about kind of entrepreneurship and thinking about the mindset around entrepreneurial mindset and how you then apply that to agriculture and to farming and allowing outside thought to come to the table. And I'll give two great examples. Jeff and Justine Ross at Lake Howe Air Station and somebody who I've recently met called Mike Casey from NZ Zero and Forest Lodge, which is a fossil fuel free orchard in Otago. Can't think of the exact area. They're outside thinkers that have come into the industry and making waves of change just within their organization, but then as thought leaders. We need to allow that space of more entrepreneurial mindset to come into the industry. Otherwise, it's never going to progress and move forward and embrace them and love them and wrap our arms around them and celebrate them rather than putting them down and yeah I think we just need to elevate the entrepreneurs that are interested in this space um, and allow them the space to get creative and do the things that they you know, are, are able to do uh, and allow them to come into an industry to embed some change. Mm. Hopefully in the next six months I'm interviewing a chap, I won't say too much, but he's worked in the sheep industry and in the wool industry for 40 years, a bit more. And he has been unsuccessful on four or five, six ventures. Now, all those ventures have created change, but they haven't actually hit the ultimate goal. And in the ag sector, they see him often as a failure. Mm. In another industry, they would see him as an inventor mm. and a explorer. And... Uh, and now after 40 years he is doing some work that is just building on all of the work that he's done before now in the wool industry and mm. it's just and it's going on behind the scenes and the powers that be don't want to talk to him and he's just getting on with it and it's 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 phenomenal and I, I often say to him because it's been really lonely for him mm. And I've often said, mate, if you were in the tech industry, you'd be a fucking superstar. But in the sheep industry, you're a pain in the ass, mm. you know. And it's just, it's that's that's a that's a mindset thing that we're really going to have to work on, Kath, that to allow people to come in, experiment. Mm. Experiment and, is a great word. And 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 relish there when they trip over. Yeah. You know, because embrace them when they trip over. Yeah, embrace them when they trip over. Pick them up, pat them on the back, and help them keep going. Uh, because it's interesting. All the stuff he's been working on has all just come together mm. now in these different right ways. And there's about mm. five of them have all just lined up. And he's wow. he's my age, and he's like this kid mm. in a sandpit. And mm. I'm just going, you know, it's fabulous. I'm really looking forward to seeing that. 
that uh, being exposed publicly because it's all happening behind the scenes now. Mm, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Kath, welcome to New Zealand. Thank you. Uh, you have made a big impact in a very short time here. Um, are you going to hang around in New Zealand? In New Zealand, yeah. yes, absolutely. I'm yeah. here to educate my children. <laughs> Where do they call home? Oh, really, probably Marlborough these days. Um, yeah, Sydney will always be Sydney will always be home to them. But I guess when we do talk about going home, it's up to back up to Marlborough. Right. Yeah, which is a beautiful, which is a beautiful thing. So we have a beautiful community of wonderful people up there that make it home because we were embraced. There was this beautiful sense of belonging when we when we moved there. That's home. So, Kath, welcome to New Zealand. Thank you for doing this work and shining the light. Uh, and good luck with the rejections. And not accepting any more thanks. <laughs> <laughs> From and this day forward, I will no, no longer have any rejections of any of my projects. You're bullshitting now. It it's comes with the territory, doesn't it? Yeah, when you're trying new things. It comes with the, with the territory and it's, it's, um, it's something that, you know, entrepreneurs do stuff that other people just don't do. Yeah. And um, it's interesting that that I I get frustrated when... They they get these speakers up who have been successful and they've done their thing. And I think, why don't you get people up to speak when they haven't done their thing, when they're in the middle of the graph? Trenches. That's in the trenches, because mm. that's really interesting right there. Yeah. And, you know, then you hear people when they've been through it and they say, oh, it's never about the money. And I'm going, oh, that is rubbish. Because when you're, when you're in the trenches and you've got no money... It's not all about the money, but you need it. You need money to keep going. Yeah. You know? So it's it's not the be all and end all. But you often think it'd be great to to, to bring speakers in who are in the trenches and, mm. and toiling through it. it. Would be a lot more interesting than yeah. the shiny stuff that gets banded out. So, Kath, welcome to New Zealand. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Good luck with girls who grow. Thank you. And including this old white fella that was leaning on the doorpost in your journey. <laughs> Thank you, Harv. Thanks for listening in. We Collective Intelligence, a one-of-a-kind people ecosystem that takes inspiration from Mother Nature. To find out how we reimagine leadership development, visit our website, www dot collective intelligence dot co dot nz